With this watch in my hand now, I feel uh, thrilled and delighted. Because for me, it's been an incredible journey, an incredible development. I mean, we did it very quickly. MBNF are great people to work for, but they work at a breakneck speed because they, what they do is absolutely incredible. The idea of releasing a completely new watch every year is almost unheard of. So if you want to work for MBNF, you've got to work to that schedule. So the whole development was done. I started work on it in October 2012, and I delivered the functioning prototype to the team in Geneva in December 2014. So in just over two years, the whole thing was done. I didn't sleep much in the two years, and I worked nearly all the weekends in the two years, but the result, the result for me is, uh, it makes me feel very emotional and extremely proud, and um, you know, all the hard work was, was worth it. The whole collaboration goes back quite a long way, because whenever MBNF were creating the very first watch, which was HM1, back in 2006, I was involved then because I had already worked quite a bit with Peter Speak. Peter Speak is one of the friends on HM1. So when they came to do that watch, I was uh, called in to work with the prototyping of the watch. There were certain technical issues which, which were outstanding, which needed to be sorted out. So I came in and I did the prototyping and I was, solved those problems. And in that way, MBNF was able to launch the watch. My background is such that I come from watchmaking, practical watchmaking on the bench. So I've always, that's where I started. And as I have moved more and more towards movement design and development and conception, whenever I'm working in designing a movement or conceiving a movement, I always look at what I'm doing with the eyes of a watchmaker. One of the big disconnects in the whole industry is that you have the constructor, the developer, the movement developer guy, and you've got the, the watchmaker. Never the twain shall meet. So that means that these guys often create these amazing things which look brilliant on the screen. But when actually it comes to the watchmaker assembling the movement, doing after sale service, whatever, there can be all sorts of problems, difficulties, things which the guy, because he's never sat at a bench, used a screwdriver and a pair of tweezers and taken things apart, put them back together, he doesn't see the difficulties the watchmaker's gonna have to overcome. In the, other, in the same way, the watchmaker never designs anything. So if I have something to bring to it, it's the fact that I, I speak from both worlds, if you like. And I think that, I would like to think that makes me a better watch developer overall. There's several things to say with, uh, with regard to the problems which you find with a conventional perpetual calendar. One of those is the way the watch actually displays the date. Because a conventional perpetual calendar is based on a calculation of 31. It's a wheel with 31 days. That means every month, which is shorter than 31 days, you need to skip over the days that you don't want. So for example, the 20th of February, if you observe what the watch is doing, say, around between 11 in the evening and 3 in the morning on the 20th of February, you'll see the hand move from the 28th to the 29th, 30th, 31, and you come to rest on the 1st. That means for maybe 45 minutes during that period, you can actually read the 30th of February, the 31st of February, etc. So this is, this is not at all elegant. So I wanted to create a system which will, which will get rid of this problem. So my system is based on 28 which is the shortest possible month. It's actually very simple and logical. So rather than have the longest possible month and some tr subtract the unwanted days, I take the shortest possible month and I add in the days that I want for each individual month according to the length of that month. Therefore, every month is, is uh, displayed with exactly the right number of days. The calendar always travels to the last day of the month and then instantaneously ret the hand retrogrades to the first of the new month. There's no skipping through unwanted days. This is a very important point. A second thing that watch does is that normally with a conventional system, you've got the month and the year which are linked together. You don't have any direct access to the year or the year correction. That means that in the cycle of four years or 48 months, if you want to go back one month, effectively you've got to go forward 47. You've got to press the corrector 47 times. I disassociated those two functions. And now there's a, a system to directly correct the year. That means with one press, you jump straight forward 12, 12, uh, 12 months, a whole year. The perpetual calendar is a very fragile mechanism. It's, it's certainly a very important point. A lot of people here are discussing the fact that with the conventional ones, they all have this thing where they call them boomerang, boomerang watches. They keep coming back. And this is very true, particularly if you manipulate the correctors at around midnight, whenever the calendar is in the process of changing from one day to the next. If you go pressing correctors, doing stuff then, you can often break teeth, you can break levers, you can create all sorts of problems. And once that's happened, there's nothing to do but send the watch back to be repaired. Yeah. So right from the start, Max was absolutely adamant. He said to me, Stephen, we've got to create a watch which is foolproof. Now this is an enormous challenge because it's one thing to say that, it's entirely another thing to, to, to actually make it happen. So we've actually had the situation now where Max was at a dinner last week, he was telling me about it and 
one of the collectors there, he said, okay, Max, give us the watch. Max gave him the watch, and the guy was there, pressed all the buttons at once, turns the hands backwards, does whatever, and everything's fine. This was the aim, so actually, whenever things are sensitive, what I've done is I've created a system for the months and year correctors whereby the correctors are actually become deactivated. You can press the button, but nothing happens. Therefore, there's no risk of anything being damaged or broken at any time. Well, that was one of the, one of the things which, I let, which, which uh, MBNF wanted to do, was create this within the legacy machine sort of style or line. So uh, it, this is a great vehicle for this kind of watch because it obviously it, it, um, it takes inspiration from classical watchmaking, but it then twists it and innovates and makes something which is, a, which is like a fusion of classical influences, but very, very modern and highly technical. This watch was great to do this. The big central balance is obviously a superb feature and it's part of the DNA of the legacy machine watches. Um, but I thought a really interesting thing to do would be to make the escapement visible. Because on the LM1, for example, the escapement's visible, but on the dial. Now, this isn't possible with the Perpetual because with all the displays and dials here, there's, firstly, there's nowhere to put it. And secondly, even if there was room, you wouldn't be able to see it because there's, you know, it, it, it could never be done in such a way that it would, would look cluttered. So I thought the best thing to do would be put it right on the back of the watch. The balance staff, which is the axle on which the balance oscillator is turning, it traverses the entire movement and presents the escapement actually on the bridge's side. So with this watch, we've got, I don't know, maybe the world's longest balance staff ever in a wristwatch. Conventionally, a wristwatch balance staff would be about three millimeters, and this one, it's 11.8, so it's a monster. So the balance goes all, the balance staff goes all the way from the balance at the top right through the movement and pivots in the dual in the center, which you see there. But that allows visibility and legibility of the escapement. The creation of the long balance staff, it, it is a challenge from a manufacturing point of view. And that the problem is that whenever you, it's extremely long and thin, so it's 11.8 millimeters long, 0.8 millimeters thick. So the problem is that it can bend, whenever, especially whenever you do the heat treatment on the steel, it can bend. Uh, so MBNF weren't convinced that this was viable at the start. So whenever I proposed this idea, they liked the idea, but they weren't convinced it would work. What we did was they gave me the prototype of LM1. And on the prototype of LM1, I, in my own workshop, I hand built the balance stuff. So I hand turned it with a hand lathe. I made this. 11.8 millimeter balance staff, and I made extension pillars to build on the LM1 prototype. So I used the LM1 bridge, the LM1 um, basic movement, and I used extension pillars to lift the, 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 the balance bridge right up into the air, and I could then put the 11.8 millimeter balance staff on the prototype for LM1 to prove that it, it would work without any problems, which it did. Uh, it's a combination of, um, yes, at the bench, and also with, the, with, 3, with 3D design. Everything is done these days with, uh, with CAD. You know, it's, it's CAD's a totally essential tool in watchmaking. So between those two things, so with this, for example, I designed the whole concept, I developed the whole movement, I did all the technical plans, we then got to the stage of prototyping. So I prototyped the very first movement myself in my workshop in Belfast. And the thing about that is straight away with a calendar, because it's complicated, with even the very best 3D modeling, you can never tell absolutely what's gonna happen in certain cases. Because I've got my own workshop with all the lathes and milling machines and so on that I would need, as soon as I see there's a problem, I can redesign a part, remake the part myself, and have it done by lunchtime, back in the watch, whereby, whereas if I was working in conjunction with Switzerland, I would have to remodel the part, send it off to them, eight weeks later, I get the remodeled part, so because of that, I can be very reactive. I was always passionate about watchmaking, about clocks, about horology, since I was a small child. I mean, it maybe sounds cliche to say it, but I, I never chose it, it chose me from the womb, you know? and. Uh, I, it's, I have no say in it at all. It's absolutely, I'm totally addicted to it. I can't live with it, can't live without it. I had never thought about becoming a watchmaker professionally until much later, because it's kind of unknown in Belfast, even in Britain to a large extent, you know? As that, to take that as a career, it's something I thought I would always have for myself privately, but I followed other paths in the meantime. It was only later on I realized actually I could go to Switzerland, I could study, and I could really seriously pursue this, you know? Once I did that, I went to Wastep in 2001, and as soon as I was there, the learning curve was like vertical. And I knew within a few months that this was what I was going to be seriously, seriously working at. You know, so I initially went to do a six-month course at Wastep and go home again in 2001. While I was there, they proposed I should stay on and become an instructor. And I did that and uh, stayed in Switzerland for 13 and a half years.